次はですね、えー、とオープンソースのクラウドインフラストラクチャーとどのように付き合っていったらいいかというのをオープンソースの専門企業であるキャノニカルのステファンからですね、えー、紹介してもらうと思いますステファンウェルカムステージグッドモーニング My name is Stefan Fable. I'm here to talk to you、uh, about the 10 new rules of open source infrastructure. I'm head of product at a company called Canonical.、Um, uh, my Twitter handle is there. Feel free to follow me and uh, uh, you know, search me out after this talk for more discussion. Happy to, to engage in,、uh, uh, in conversation with you about some of the things that I want to talk about today. So, who's Canonical? We're a company that's、uh, been around for about 15 years. We uh, uh, have offices, as you can see, all over, all over the place. Most of our、uh, employees actually work from home.、Uh, there's around 600 of them.、Uh, we, we have、uh, them spread across 28 countries. And as you can see, there is,、um, there is uh, uh, even an office here in Tokyo. So、uh, we're very much looking forward to engaging with you even here in, in Japan. And we're most well known for、uh, being the, the creators of Ubuntu,、uh, open source Linux. Uh, operating system.、Um, we're very proud of,、uh, of Ubuntu and our delivery of it,、uh, whether that be for private cloud or for container、uh, based uh, projects around the world. And、uh, y- you know, as we engaged in this journey over the last 15 years, we hit a bunch of really exciting milestones.、We're、very humbled and very,、uh, at the same time, very proud of the achievement and,、uh, and very glad of the endorsement that the community has given us. And has given Ubuntu over the course of those 15 years. And so our mission has always been to、uh, provide seamless access and frictionless access to open source,、uh, making upstream community contributions available and consumable for enterprises, users, developers, innovators all over the place. And we're very happy、um, to have seen this. Uh, uh, you know, work out so well in so many different spaces. So, 60 to 80 percent of our workloads on the public clouds are based on Ubuntu. We're、uh, one of the most popular uh, uh, operating system and base images for your container based uh, uh, workloads. We are,、uh, you know, a very extremely popular、uh, basis for、uh, many, many OpenStack deployments around the world. And、uh, we've, we've seen an incredible amount of adoption around the web in hosted Linux as well. But recently, actually, we've engaged in a,、uh, in a journey that we're even more proud of, which is、uh, we've actually worked、uh, earlier this year、uh, on our website, our new Japanese website. And when we finally published that in May, uh, uh, we, uh, we actually you know, found out that Japan actually started a new era in honor of this new website. So、uh, thank you very much for,、uh, for endorsing our efforts so, uh, 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 so graciously. I encourage you to check out uh, uh, our new website here.、Uh, but as you can see, even your, your, your chief cabinet minister is endorsing our efforts here quite well. So thank you very much.、Um, but without further ado, I, you know, I,、uh, let's dive into the 10 new rules of open infrastructure. And、uh, you know, I want to highlight that I don't mean this in the you know, Moses、uh, you know, coming down from Mount Sinai. You know, These are the rules, and you shall follow them. Way. This is really just based on observations about things that happened over the last、uh, you know, years that we've seen as I engage personally with customers, with users of OpenStack, of Kubernetes, of containers, of Linux,、uh, you know, some of the things, that, some of the errors that they've,、uh, that they've made, some of the learnings that they take, took away. And so I rephrase them in what I call the, the 10 new rules of, of open infrastructure. So let's dive right in. The first one, and to me the most important one, is that、uh, you should consume unmodified upstream. And why is that?、Uh, why do I say this? There, in the beginning, especially、uh, uh, you know, in the earlier、uh, years of,、uh, of OpenStack, but also in the earlier years of, of Linux, right, there was this notion that、uh, somebody had to come in and turn an open source upstream project into something that is actually better, sort of the enterprise version or the hardened version of something that is upstream. And maybe that,、uh, that may have had a place in,、uh, you know, several years ago. But I think it's pretty safe to say that OpenStack unmodified upstream is absolutely、uh, able to run all kinds of、uh, workloads. Indeed,、uh, you, know, you heard Mark speak about this this morning, right? The kind of stuff that runs on OpenStack today is simply mind blowing. And this is not based on 
somebody coming in and intersecting themselves uh, between what's produced by the community and what is available commercially. And indeed, actually, if you use uh, unmodified upstream, you actually uh, uh, you know, now are able to interact with a much broader set of people who know what's going on. If you are uh, restricting yourself to a special version of something that is available upstream, you're automatically also limiting the availability of support of people who know what you're talking about, of that common ground and then common basis of, uh, of conversation, right? So it's really, uh, to me, the most, important, uh, the most important lesson or the most important rule, you should consume it unmodified upstream. Now, this is, of course, kind of a play on, uh, on, on the words, right? But, uh, you know, to me, infrastructure is a product. It is not a, a service. It is not handcrafted, valuable, uh, a technical debt that only exists in your best engineer's head, and when that best engineer is then taking a different job somewhere else, you're out of luck. It is a product, it has standard requirements, standard attributes, it can be taught, it can be uh, handed over, and it can be run, and it can be scaled out that way. If you think about your infrastructure in that fashion, you're able to also understand, for example, that you are going to market with that as a product. When we, as Canonical, sell an OpenStack cloud, we never call it, they bought our cloud. We never talk about it that way. What we say is, we helped them go to market with their cloud. We helped our customer implement their cloud. And why is that important? It's important because you're going to be judged, and that, and indeed, not only just uh, infrastructure, actually any project is going to be judged on the commercial viability of it, right? the cost profile that it exhibits, et cetera. And especially when a new product gets started, whether that's the containerization product, or it is a, a, you know, a migration phase, as Melanie uh, talked about, or it is uh, you know, simply the rollout of a new uh, uh, infrastructure as a service uh, uh, effort, right? The first year is the most expensive. And I, I'm pretty sure, I don't have hard data on this, but I'm pretty sure that for every, for every cloud, that's successful, there was probably 15 that got canned simply because the cost profile after one year didn't work out, right? After a year, somebody looked at this thing and said, look, we spent so much money on, on consultancy and on, on people who knew what they were doing on implementing this thing that, you know, it ends up not being viable. So think about infrastructure, infrastructure as a product because it will help you uh, and guide you and inform you as you roll this out. And somebody who does this really well is, is Yahoo Japan, right? They uh, really understood that infrastructure is a product. They uh, run their open stack in, in, in three regions, right? Uh, it's a pretty sizable open stack. It has a uh, you know, sizable Ceph cluster that goes along with it. And they are really to, uh, uh, taking this to heart and are really implementing this. So you should, you should talk to uh, Yahoo Japan if you, if you meet them uh, today. Um, so very, very happy to say that they've uh, taken all these lessons to heart and implemented them. You should also automate for day 1826. What's 1826? Well, that's, uh, that's five years, and you know, it has a leap year. It's not always true. Sometimes five years don't have a leap year, and if you don't know why, then you should look it up. It's interesting. Um, but uh, the, the point is, is that, uh, that most people think they've automated, and it's probably always true that you can always automate more, and there's always more automation possible than you think, and you're almost never done as early as you think with your automation. So for example, most people will, will say, okay, well, I, I have implemented a, uh, a, let's say, CI-CD pipeline for my deployment of my, uh, of my infrastructure. But what about other lifecycle management events? What about upgrades? What about integrations? What about things that, that are required, that are ex external, that are required to now interact with your infrastructure? How do you deal with those events? Do you have an automated way to deal with those things? And so, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it boils down to, to are you able to express your desire uh, of the current, of the end state that you want that infrastructure to exhibit, and are you able to kick that process off so that it automatically starts to, um, starts to make that a reality. So think through uh, over those five years, because that is your hardware uh, spend cycle, right? You, you buy uh, hardware today uh, for a specific purpose, but who knows what you're going to use that hardware for three years down the road. You might use it for OpenStack. You might use it for Kubernetes. You might use it for a mix. You might so throw some Ceph in there. 
uh, Kubernetes might be running on OpenStack. It may be running on bare metal next to OpenStack. You have no way to predict how this is going to look like. So are you able to adjust and, and accommodate all those requests from your developers to, um, uh, to implement all of those things? And so people who, who really in, uh, implemented this right, are uh, found at DNA. What they used actually is a, a, a service that we offer called LifePatch, which allows you to apply security patches uh, to the running kernel without requiring a reboot. And that helped uh, DNA prevent unplanned maintenance windows, thereby reducing the operational cost profile of, the, uh, of their infrastructure. And so as a consequence, you know, uh, they were able to be more compelling for their users in their constituency and for their constituency in their, um, in the, for their tenants, basically. You should run at capacity on-prem. Why is that important? Because it's actually very simple, right? Uh, if you think about uh, the cost per unit that you're trying to, uh, that you're trying to offer, then uh, running at capacity is only natural because that allows you to exhibit the best cost per unit um, because you slice it so thinly, right? And there's no reason not to do this. If you design and if you pick your hardware correctly, if you pick the best bang for the buck uh, hardware that allows you to, that's not always the cheapest, but it is the one that has the best memory, the best throughput, and the best uh, uh, computing pro profile that you can afford. And if you implement this, uh, uh, you know, and, and roll this out in your data center, running that at capacity, really, why wouldn't you, right? You want to leverage as much as possible of that on-prem hardware. You should use public cloud for overflow scenarios, for disaster recovery scenarios, for migration scenarios, for all kinds of scenarios where you need a temporary place of things to put. Why is that? Well, I mean, it's very simple. Sometimes you want to rent a car, sometimes you want to own a car. If you want to drive every day, renting at some point becomes not feasible anymore, right? So at that point, you will want to buy a car because you're driving every day. But in other cases, being able to rent a car or just jump into an Uber is quite useful. And so, you know, for the, that's kind of how we, we think about the relationship between uh, public cloud or public infrastructure and private infrastructure. And to us, there is no, um, or at least to me anyway, there is no, there is no real um, uh, uh, enmity between the two concepts. So use them both. Use them, actually use more than one public cloud and in addition to an on-prem uh, strategy that, you know, that is compelling. You should also upgrade and not backport. Why? Uh, well, actually, part of that is what uh, uh, Melanie talked about, right? You incur technical debt every time you don't do that. So part of the results of you not upgrading is that you are faced with having to do a lot of potentially very expensive migrations at some point because you have to really rip and replace some of the technology you had rolled out uh, before you're able to, um, to actually move to the next step. And when you consider some of the uh, upstream community projects that, you're, uh, that we're talking about here this week, you have four Kubernetes releases a year, you have uh, two OpenStack releases a year, and you have actually not that long of an upstream support endorsement for any of those uh, uh, open source projects, right? So it's really no, there's really no choice but to upgrade instead of trying to backport uh, selective patches into something that now becomes, again, a handcrafted infrastructure, something that isn't a product, and that also is going to be in your way uh, when you try to use public infrastructure for overflow, right? Because nobody runs that cluster uh, like you do then. <coughs> so this is something that, that is near and dear to my heart. So this is uh, actually uh, a rule that came out of, uh, uh, you know, long, long uh, years of, of consultancy work that I've done in, uh, you know, with, relates, with, with relation to, you know, OpenStack and, uh, and cloud rollouts. And this is really that workload pla placement really matters. <coughs> so what, um, what most people are, uh, are thinking about is, uh, when, when they think about cloud or infrastructure as a service, what, th what they say is, well, I'm running a cloud, right? I'm, I'm implementing a cloud. <clears throat> so what, why, why should I care where this workload runs, right? The whole point of me running a pro programmable infrastructure is so that I can just let that thing take care of where my workload is. And that's true. You don't care where your workload is, except when you do. And then at that point, when you do care where it is, for example, when you have unexplicable 
uh, SLA violations, or you have no idea why uh, on those three nodes the, the load peaked and uh, you know you you just or it has just a, you have no idea why this other node exhibits uh, or has memory pressure or any of this stuff, then you absolutely want to know what ran on that node at the time that this happened. Remember, programmable infrastructure means that you're also um, uh, you know, dealing with a dynamic situation. It's not just this cluster over here that runs this workload and that cluster over here that runs that workload. At any cloud of, uh, of, of sizable volume, at any given point in time, you have no idea what's running uh, you know, and what's sharing that infrastructure with whatever else, right? And it gets quite complicated quite quickly. So maintain correlation between what's happening at the application layer and with what's happening on the infrastructure layer at all times. It lets you debug more effectively. It lets you uh, conduct an RCA much more uh, effectively and much quicker. <coughs> Plan for transition. Now this is sort of, it, it sounds like a repeat, but really what it is, think of, uh, think of edge. Okay, so um, edge use cases, you have uh, working groups in, uh, you know, in, the, in the CNCF, you have working groups in the OpenStack Foundation, you have working groups in you know, in Etsy, you have everybody is talking about Edge, right? So what is Edge? Nobody knows. Every, it's Edge is everybody, uh, is something different for everybody, and that's, that's fine, right? The, the point is, it's transitionary. You will roll out Edge initiatives today with some workloads in mind. Think of telco edges. Today, you have virtualized network functions. Tomorrow, you'll have containerized network functions. And you know what? It's not going to be uh, from A to B in one go, right? You'll have... A part of those uh, BNFs will remain virtual machines, and you'll love them, and you'll run them, and you'll, you, know, you want to roll them out. And then there's going to be others uh, that are containerized. And so those you want to run on Kubernetes. So the thing is, that is the state of transition in Edge Cloud that we will have to deal with over the next three to five years. So plan for that transition. Don't think of introducing Kubernetes as some kind of end state in that manner, it is a transitionary uh, stage, and you, you have to simply be able to accommodate that. So, no matter what your plan is uh, for your for your architecture, um, uh, you know, for Edge, I think the point is is that if you implement full automation, uh, you can exhibit the necessary operational agility to deal with those transitions as they come. And I think that is really the most important point in that um, in, in in those next three to five years. Security should not be special. And I've seen this over and over and over again. <clears throat> the conversations usually happen between ops and developers, right? So you have uh, developers wanting something and uh, ops having to implement something. And then they figure this out and they get together and they're all happy. And then security is being called in and they throw a bucket of cold water over all those plants because you know, it's not secure. It's, it doesn't conform to the specifications and all of that. And so that leads to a lot of revisiting of a lot of earlier assumptions. It leads to delays in the rollout of the infrastructure. It leads to the economics not working out. You're losing time. This is your first year. You need to offer better infrastructure at more compelling uh, prices than the alternative, remember, right? Your infrastructure is a product. So security should not be special. It should be on the forefront of your mind. You should be thinking about security at the same way as you think about any other non-functional requirement that you're talking about. So think about security from the get-go. Don't bring security in late. You should also embrace shiny objects. Why shouldn't you, right? If, if somebody wants to um, uh, you know, work with this new uh, upstream project and is really excited about, why wouldn't they? Why should you, why should you say, oh, that's just a shiny object. Don't, don't get distracted. Focus on what's important. You should absolutely allow and foster innovation in your developers. You should absolutely allow and, and, and help further trying to use the next step in, uh, in infrastructure or in containerization, in uh, uh, virtual machine management, in whatever it happens to be. If your developers want to use serverless frameworks, why shouldn't they? If your developers want to use TensorFlow, why shouldn't they? It should be okay for that to be rolled out. If security was on the forefront of your mind, if you have full-on automation, if you, can, uh, if you have designed for transition, being able to accommodate even uh, uh, those more complicated requests at a higher frequency right, should be something that you, need, uh, you should be prepared for uh, accommodating. 
And then last but not least, you know, be edgy, go micro. Uh, shameless plug. But you should, uh, you should check out MicroStack. Uh, that's our OpenStack uh, for the edge. Uh, it's a single install on Rails uh, OpenStack. You just run this thing. Uh, it's in beta right now. We're looking to add limited cluster, uh, clustering functionality to it. Uh, try and install, uh, install this on any uh, uh, one of those 42 compatible uh, Linux distributions with uh, the Snap subsystem. Um, so try, uh, try it out. Install MicroStack at, uh, for Edge for personal development, for CI CD purposes, anywhere you need to stand up OpenStack very quickly in a pristine state, in a standard fashion, this is what you should do. And the pendant for that is uh, MicroKates, uh, the same thing for Kubernetes that is uh, extremely uh, useful for you as a developer, installing that on your local laptop, using it for CI, where oftentimes as part of your integration testing, you do want a Kubernetes to be st stood up. It supports popular plugins as add-ons, for example, Istio, Jaeger, Linkerd, etc. So a lot of the, um, those, those uh, uh, projects that you've seen earlier this morning are actually implemented as an add-on with a simple microcates.enable uh, and then the add-on name, and you've got that. So you can stand up very, uh, very quickly reference uh, implementations of your Kubernetes uh, for, for all kinds of automation that you might, uh, that you might have implemented. So, um, that's that. Uh, be edgy, go micro, and uh, uh, you know, your 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 chief cabinet uh, minister agrees with me. You should check out microcates.io, uh, and uh, that leads me to the end of my talk. Thank you so much. <laughs>